Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to First Parish in Cotton. It's great to see you all here tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, for those of you on video, welcome. Uh, we hope that you uh, get something out of this tonight. Hopefully you learn something and uh, come away feeling inspired. Or re-inspired, as the case may be. Uh, my name is Fred Van Dusen, and I'm one of the leaders of Reclaim Our Democracy. That's the group sponsoring this event. Uh, we formed this group a few years ago, and our mission is to reclaim our democratic rights as citizens of the United States of America, to have a government that truly represents and supports the needs and desires of all people. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, you can read more about the topic, and you can also see what we're up to on our website, reclaimourdemocracy.org. There's some cards out there if you need to take one with you to remember that. It's worth a look. Uh, we also have a Facebook page that you can follow, and uh, we keep things up to date on that in terms of what's going on. And you can sign up for our mailing list. So lots of ways to get involved with us. But now, let me introduce you to Lawrence Lessig. <coughs> He's pretty amazing, actually. <laughs> Lawrence Lessig is an American academic attorney and political activist. He's one of the most interesting biographies I've ever read, similar to mine, <laughs> in two regards. <laughs> we're both married and have three children. <laughs> and we're both working to reclaim our mom. <laughs> then uh, there are a few other things he's done that I have. He's attended the University of Pennsylvania, Cambridge University in England, and Yale has received degrees in economics, management, philosophy, and law. Pretty good. He's currently the Roy L. Furman Professor of Law and Leadership at Harvard Law School. He also taught at the University of Chicago and at Stanford Law School, where he founded the Center for Internet and Society. He's a big proponent of net neutrality and free open source software. He also was a founder of the Creative Commons organization. He clerked for Judge Richard Posner on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals and Justice Antonin Scalia on the U.S. Supreme Court. Interestingly, when he was young, he held strong conservative or libertarian political views, desired a career in business, was a highly active member of teenage Republicans, and almost pursued a Republican political career. I think that's true. <laughs> Then as a student of philosophy at Cambridge University in England, he radically changed his values and career path. In 2007, as a result of a transformative conversation with Aaron Schwartz, a young internet prodigy, Lessig announced that he would stop focusing his attention on copyright and related legal matters and work instead on political corruption. Since then, he's written multiple books and many articles on the subject of political corruption, spoken extensively, appeared in numerous podcasts and videos, established the Equal Citizens Organization, worked with political consultant Joe Trippi to launch a web-based project called Change Congress, which later became Fritz Congress First and was finally named Root Strikers, supported organizations working to amend the Constitution and address the corruption of money in politics, including Wolfpack, American Promise, Represent Us, and I'm sure others. He marched 185 miles from Dixville, Notch, New Hampshire to Nashua, which wrote the idea of tackling the system corruption in Washington. He appeared in a film with Edward Snowden, and he ran for president in 2016. His campaign was focused on a single issue, the Citizen Equality Act, a proposal that coupled campaign finance reform with other laws aimed at curbing gerrymandering and ensuring voting access. And he's received numerous awards, including a Webby Lifetime Achievement Award, the Free Software Foundations Award, Fast Case 50 Award, and being named one of Scientific American's top 50 visionaries. <coughs> but personally, I think his biggest honor actually occurred when Lessig was portrayed by Christopher Lloyd in the wake-up call during season, season six of The West Wing. <laughs> <laughs> in that episode, constitutional scholar Lawrence Lessig works with Toby and Belarusian diplomats on a new constitution. So we are fortunate indeed to have him here tonight to speak with us. I'm extremely pleased to welcome Lawrence Lessig. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. 
It is so wonderful to be here and so happy that I can support the work of Reclaim Our Democracy. I'm in an odd position because I'm one of the only optimistic people about this struggle right now in America. Now, that's very unusual for me because I'm usually incredibly pessimistic. That's my brand. Most of my books are very dark. Um, but in fact, I've come to the place where I recognize we have an extraordinary chance. If we can only focus this monster called our political process on the opportunity that sits right before us. And so that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. I want to talk first by acknowledging something that you know that is true. <clears throat> You're here, this organization was founded because you know something that is true. You know we live in the greatest democracy that never was, <laughs> promised to us by the oldest living written constitution that there ever was, a promise that still to this day has not been performed and my view is it is time it be performed because we cannot wait any longer for that democracy. It's been more than 20 years since a clear majority of Americans have acknowledged the truth of climate change and our responsibility for it. Yet, to this day, Congress has not passed a single comprehensive statute to address that problem. We have one of the highest medical care systems in the world, with more than 25% of the budget devoted to administrative costs, and more than 12% of Americans still uninsured. Yet the most that Congress can do is to argue about whether pre-existing conditions should deny you the right to health care in America. If you talk to the engineers in America, they would tell you our infrastructure gets a grade of D as an academic. That's a very significant thing for me. <laughs> they say we need to spend $1.5 trillion by 2025 to make America safe again. But the closest that Congress can come to $1.5 trillion is a $1.6 trillion tax cut given to the very wealthy and corporations in America. Now these problems were not caused by a single man, <laughs> however great his ego may be. These problems are the consequence of a system that does not represent us. And to solve these problems, we have to fix it, fix that system, and we have to fix it first. Okay, but how? To understand how to fix this system, we have to see its source of trouble. And its source is a single word. The word is inequality. Now, by using that word, I don't mean to talk about racial inequality, though, of course, the inequality I'm talking about makes the consequence of racial inequality even greater. I'm not talking about sex inequality, though the inequality that I'm talking about manifests itself in even greater burdens for those burdened by sex inequality. I'm not talking about economic inequality, though, of course, the inequality I'm talking about has driven economic inequality to an extent we've not seen in more than a century. The inequality I'm talking about is political inequality. And to grab one of your neighbor's insights and ways to think about this problem, Thoreau said, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. What I want you to understand is that this Inequality is the root to all the problems that we see manifesting themselves in this political system today. The framers of our Constitution gave us what they called a republic. But by a republic, they meant a, quote, representative democracy. 
And by a representative democracy, you might have gotten this from the title, what they meant was a system that would be representative, that it would represent all of us equally. But we have evolved a system that is deeply unrepresentative because of the unequal way in which we as citizens exist within the system. Now you can see that inequality along many dimensions. Let me just pick out four. Do we have an equal freedom to vote in America? The answer is obviously we do not. Because of techniques adopted by states to suppress the votes mainly of people who don't happen to be in the party of the party that controls those systems, but especially if the color of your skin is not white. The reality in America is that these systems are adopted for the purpose of making it harder for some to vote than for others. Charles Stewart at MIT estimates in the last election probably 16 million Americans experienced that election in a way that denied them an equal opportunity to vote. Do we have an equal opportunity to vote for president as citizens in America? And the answer to that is obviously we do not. Not so much directly because of the Electoral College, but because of the winner-take-all system that the states have adopted for allocating their Electoral College votes. As you know, all but two states say that the winner of the popular vote in that state gets all of the Electoral College votes in that state, regardless of how much that winner has won by. So in Massachusetts, what that means is though 40% of the votes can go for a Republican for president, the Republican gets zero Electoral College votes. But when you think about that for the country as a whole, it's obvious you don't have to be a Paul Begala or a Joe Trippi to know exactly how you would play a campaign for president if winner take all is the rule. You would only ever vote or campaign in states that were close, swing states or battleground states. So in 2016, there were 14 swing states, states that could go one way or the other. Those 14 states saw 95% of the campaign appearances and 99% of the spending in those political campaigns. Now those 14 states do not represent America. They're older, they're whiter, their industry is sort of late 19th century, early 20th century industry. There are seven and a half times as many Americans working in solar energy as mine coal. But you never hear about solar energy in a presidential election because those people work in California and Texas. It's the coal miners who live in these swing states. So what that means is we have presidents who get elected sucking up to an unrepresentative few of Americans because they know they are the people they need to get elected to president, which means that more than 85 million Americans go to vote knowing or they should know their vote will mean nothing to the president who was elected. Or do we have an equal vote in the House of Representatives? Here too, the answer is obviously no, because of a system of gerrymandering which our governor gave politics more than 200 years ago, Governor Jerry, Gary um, created this system for drawing districts to make sure that your candidates won and the other side's candidates do not. So gerrymandering is now manifested in a construction of many, many safe seats in the House of Representatives. Safe seats meaning seats where the party in control knows that the other side can't beat them. They have a guaranteed seat in a safe seat district, whether Republican or Democrat. More than 85% of districts in the House of Representatives are safe seat districts. Districts drawn to make sure that the predicted winner is the winner. Washington Post calls this crimes against geography here. <laughs> now, but what that means is that if you are a Republican representative in a safe seat Republican district, you know the only person who can beat you is an even more extreme Republican in that district. Or if you are a Democrat in a safe seat Democrat district, 
What you know is the only person who can beat you is an even more progressive Democrat in that district, which means that the system of safe seat gerrymandering pushes the House of Representatives to the extremes as they are constantly focused on the flanks to make sure that they're not beaten by somebody even more extreme than they happen to be. Which means if you're not in the extreme, if you're not in the dominant party, your vote counts less to the representative in that district. Which means in 2016, 89 million Americans went to vote knowing or should have known that their vote just wasn't equal. Now, of course, the fourth and the most dramatic, the most grotesque way in which we are not equal as citizens is the product of the way we fund campaigns in America. We take it for granted that campaigns will be privately funded, which means we tell representatives and people who want to become representatives their first job is to raise money. Indeed, uh, as some have said their first job and their second job and their third job is to raise money. Which means in the House of Representatives right now, members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money, dialing for dollars. Sometimes my students are confused by this, but you remember, <laughs> this is a telephone. Dialing for dollars, calling a tiny fraction of the 1 percent who give them the money they need to fund their campaigns. No more, I think, than about 120,000 who are in this class of people who get called to give the money that the candidates need to fund their campaigns. 120,000 is a tiny number. I once estimated it's about the same number as the number named Lester in America, which is why in a TED talk I said America was Lester land, because to get elected, you have to make this tiny, tiny fraction happy this tiny group who will fund the campaigns. And if you don't make them happy, you're not going to be a candidate who runs effectively for Congress, which means we've created this extraordinary inequality because of the funders, which if you take about 140 million voters means that's not even the right fraction. I'd have to do this to that person to sort of represent the group who is unequal because of the system for funding campaigns. Now add these inequalities up, and this is as obvious as mud, right? They don't represent us. The more equal in this system win. The people who are not equal to everyone, but they have more power because of these inequalities built into the system. There's a Princeton study, which is a Harvard professor. I want to get that off the stage as quickly as I can. <laughs> Martin Gillens and Ben Page. Maybe the largest empirical study of the actual decisions by our government in the history of political science. Relating the actual decisions over the last 40 years to the attitudes of the economic elite, the people who fund political campaigns, organized interest groups, and then average voters. And what they find with the economic elite is what you'd expect. What this shows you is, as the percentage of the elite support something, supporting something goes up, the probability of it having been enacted goes up as well. So what this says is, it goes from 0%, if 0% supports it, to just about 33% if 100% support it. That's the relationship you expect. The more who support it, the more likely it is that it gets enacted. Here's organized interest groups. The more who support it, the more likely it is that it actually was enacted. Okay, here's the average citizens. That's a flat line, literally and figuratively. What that is saying is it doesn't matter the percentage of average citizens who support something, it doesn't change the probability of it having been enacted. As they put it in English, when the preferences of the economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy in a democracy. The average citizen's views do not matter. 
Right? When I grew up, this was our picture of democracy. There we are, we the people, kind of middle of America, where I grew up, driving the bus. Here's the reality of this democracy. The <laughs> steering wheel has become removed from the bus because we have allowed this inequality to seep into every corner of this institution we call a democracy. Okay, but the great hope here is we get it. We, Americans, all of us, get it, we feel it in our bones, and we express it in extraordinary frustration. In the middle of 2016, right in the middle of that election, in July of 2016, the University of Maryland did an incredible study trying to measure the level of anger that people felt towards their government. And they find the highest level ever in the history of polling frustration and anger with our government. Then we try to unpack exactly why people were so angry. What they found was really quite astonishing. What they found was the reasons were shared and believed by everybody in just about the same proportion. So for example, corporations and their lobbyists have too much influence. 89% of Americans believe that. 89% of Republicans, 90% of Democrats or elected officials think more about the interests of their donors than the common good. 89% of Americans, 92% of Republicans, 88% of Democrats. Or big campaign donors have too much influence, 91% of Americans, 90% of Republicans, 91% of Democrats. We are united here. I would have said we are citizens united, but that's a little confusing in this context. <laughs> we are united as citizens in this view that our system, our government, our democracy has been corrupted because we have allowed a few interests to take more power than the rest of us because we have allowed this inequality, this political inequality, to express itself inside of a republic. We believe something that is true here. And what we believe, what we believe is true is believed by all of us as true. We believe that this system is broken and that the democracy it has produced does not give Americans what Americans want. So you would think, <coughs> wouldn't you? You would think, given this that we know, you would think that everyone, all 2,000 of the people running for president right now in the United States, would be talking about this. This one issue that we all agree about. Like, polarized America, forget it. This is the issue we are united about. So you would think this is the issue they'd be talking about, but no. <laughs> this is not the issue they are talking about. Everyone checks the box, of course. They all say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm for reform. But then everyone speaks the fantasy of fantasy politics, which is the game of politics which our politicians play. What they do is they speak of the beautiful things, as if we had a democracy already. They talk about single-payer health care, or higher minimum wage, or a Green New Deal, or free college for all, as if winning an election is enough to get those things, as if getting more votes means getting what you want, as if the promise of our Constitution were already performed, as if the system were not rigged. But we should know better. We should know better. Because we believe the system is rigged. And so when we hear this fantasy politics playing itself out, we should pause and recognize that a politician who tells you these things, makes you these promises, is just not serious unless he or she describes how he or she and our government is going to fix these problems first. Because without fixing these problems first, these fantasy ideas are just fantasies. You cannot get single-payer health care in America when doctors and pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies fund campaigns. You're not going to get 
a Green New Deal so long as the carbon monopoly in America funds campaigns. You're not going to raise the taxes necessary to deal with the crisis in infrastructure in America so long as the people who pay those taxes are funding the campaigns. None of the issues that are the core issues in this political debate mean anything unless we have candidates who tell us how they're going to fix this corrupted system first. Now, I was incredibly proud that my friend, John Sarbanes, who is a Democrat from Maryland, was able to convince Nancy Pelosi to make H.R. 1 the first statute, the first bill that the House of Representatives took up in 2019. H.R. 1 is the most ambitious reform proposal that we have seen in Congress since the 1965 Voting Rights Act. What H.R. 1 does is everything except the Electoral College that I have just complained about. It addresses each of these problems. It changes the way Congress people would fund their campaigns, so they would not spend all their time sucking up to the tiny fraction of the 1%, but they could fund their campaigns independent of that tiny fraction of the 1%. It uses the constitutionally granted power in Congress to stop partisan gerrymandering in the states. It leverages that same power to guarantee automatic vote registration and a restoration of the Voting Rights Act to assure that everybody has an equal freedom to vote. And it adds on top of that an extraordinary range of ethical constraints to stop our politicians from living the revolving door of Washington, a place where, as my friend Jim Cooper, a Democrat from Tennessee, puts it, Congress has become a, quote, farm league for K Street, K Street where the lobbyists work. This bill would, in my view, solve 85% of the problem we have. And it's not important just because it's right. What's incredibly important about what Pelosi did was that she made it first. What she signaled by saying it should be first was to show the priority of reform before thinking you could achieve anything real. She acknowledged the necessity, the recognition that nothing else is possible before we fix this. H.R. 1 is an incredibly important step in the arc of this wannabe democracy to a democracy that could actually represent us equally. But as great as H.R. 1 was, and it passed unanimously among Democrats in Congress, it was then stopped by the dark lord of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, who declared it a simple power grab by the Democratic Party, puzzling how giving people the right to vote is understood as a power grab, but that was his characterization. But nonetheless, it was an important step. But now we have to stop talking about HR1. We need to start talking about POTUS1. We need to start talking about the fundamental reform that these candidates for president will make first on their list. And we have to get every one of these candidates to make what we could call a POTUS 1 pledge. We need to tell us what will they do if they are elected to change this corrupted system? How will they make it happen? And we need politicians with the courage to utter these words. I've seen it. It's hard for them to come out of these words to come out of their mouths. They work hard at it. They're going to stumble a little bit. But we need the politicians with the courage to utter the words public funding of public campaigns so that we have a system where the politicians are not focused on this tiny fraction of funders but can focus on citizens generally. Because if they don't, This extraordinary moment, this extraordinary opportunity will be lost. And if they don't make this pledge, then I think what we need to say to them is you're just not serious about what you're promising us. 
If you're not going to fix what has to be fixed first, then what you say you're going to do, you know, can't be done. And we need to measure them according to which of these candidates will most capably drain the swamp best. Now, I make that reference quite self-consciously because the most exciting fact I think about this moment is that for the first time in 30 years, both parties, or at least leaders in both parties, have acknowledged the nature of this problem. You remember four years ago when Donald Trump was going from this joke to the Republican nominee. He passed through this period where he spent an extraordinary amount of time calling out every other Republican on stage, saying, you are all bought by your funders. And super PACs are a corruption, and we have to change this corrupt system if ever we're going to have representatives who can represent you. That had not happened on a Republican debate stage. It just was not the case that the leading candidate would call out the corrupting influence of money in politics. And I think, though the mix of people who supported Donald Trump is complex and difficult, there is a significant slice of them who supported that man because they believed he would do this. And yet this is what we should want too. We should want a system that doesn't seem to us like a swamp. We should want a democracy that seems to us like it's representing us. We should want a system that doesn't appear to every American as if it's bending over backwards to make the elite happy and safe while being oblivious to the burdens felt by most Americans. This is the chance, the moment, to find this unity and to act on it. And we need this to happen now. We need this conversation right now. In May of 2019, it must happen. Because if it's not going to happen now, America's going to miss it. This one issue that unites us, too often for the politicians is just an afterthought, an answer to a question that gets raised by some pesky democracy reformer like you people, raising a question after they've given a speech about the wonderful free college they're going to guarantee to all. And then you say, what about Citizens United? Or what about PAC money in our elections? And they say, yes, of course, I support overturning Citizens United. But an afterthought is not enough. It must be the first thought, because nothing else is possible unless they make this first. So will they? My view is right now they won't, at least not yet. And the reason is the experts don't see it. You know, the experts, the people who said Donald Trump could never be elected president, those people who are advising these candidates tell them, you can't do that. You can't talk about that issue. People don't care about reform, whatever they say. It's too complicated. They're too stupid. I heard somebody say just two weeks ago, they're too stupid. Or as one of my closest friends who used to work for the Clintons said, people don't give a about process. That's not why they vote. And so because they believe that, they don't talk about this. Instead, they try to sell snake oil so that they can win. Snake oil, in the literal sense, of a formula they know will not work, but they know everyone wants. And so they know will rally everyone to their side, and they can get elected, and what they do after they're elected is not the problem of the consultant. So to win a campaign, they lose a nation. Now, here's a really important question. Can we as Americans be convinced to care about democracy? Can we be convinced to put aside the differences between right and left and focus on this issue first, here? Is that possible? Now, as I said at the start, I am incredibly optimistic because all around this country, there are people like you, 2018, saw the largest number of grassroots democracy reforms succeed 
ever in the history of this nation. Even in the progressive period, we saw nothing like the numbers of successful efforts enacted in a single election year from gerrymandering reform to rank choice voting to systems to get transparency into our political system. And that success reflects this overwhelming frustration that we have about the status quo and the opportunity that states give us to address those problems at the state level. But the question for us is whether we can do something nationally, whether a presidential campaign could do something nationally that could tap into the same passion, the same frustration of ordinary Americans and get them to say, yes, this is finally the year we will do something to end this embarrassment that has destroyed the thing that when we were kids, we thought defined us as a great democracy in the world. So this is the question, yes or no? I believe the answer is yes. I believe this is a moment when it can happen. But I will tell you, I am a tiny, tiny minority. The vast majority of the experts, the people who know something about politics, the people who know how to win campaigns will tell you the answer is no. And so when I reflect on that fact and look back on my career, recognizing that kind of hard to accept that looking back is the longer period than looking forward. <laughs> As I look back on my career, I realize I've been here many, many times. I've been here once before, but I mean, I've been at this place of, rec of believing something that no one else believes many times before. I began my career writing about the internet inspired by this man, John Perry Barlow. Barlow used to write for the Grateful Dead, write lyrics for the Grateful Dead. He was one of the founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He was one of the original internet idealists. And what he said is the internet would guarantee freedom and privacy and the opportunity for people to innovate. It was built into the DNA and there was nothing any government could do about it. And that inspired me to write this book, Code, where I said, you know, John Perry, the nature of the internet can flip because the internet is just an architecture. It's just a technical architecture, and architectures could change, and I predicted they would change as governments and business found it to be in their interest to build an internet that could better surveil us, control us, and limit our opportunities to create. When I published that book, the New York Times reviewed it. David Pogue wrote this review. He said, Lessig plays digital Cassandra, he predicts the internet will become a monster that tracks our every move, but that nobody will heed his warning. <laughs> These discussions are thoughtful and measured, but the premise that frames them all is shaky. Less it doesn't offer much proof that a Soviet-style loss of privacy and freedom is on its way. And unlike law, actual law, Internet software has no capacity to punish. It doesn't affect people who aren't online, and only a tiny minority of the world's population is. And if you don't like the internet system, you can always flip off the modem, which of course is true. You can always flip off the modem. <laughs> but this image that I had presented, this Cassandra-like image, he completely rejected, as most did, like my friend John Perry Barlow. Or about 15 years ago, I became engaged in fights around the question of copyright on the internet because the industry, especially the Disney industry, was deeply, deeply anxious that the internet was going to destroy the opportunity of people to create, of artists to make money, and that this destruction required the government to step in and to exercise much more effective control to regulate this platform. And that inspired me to write these two books in which I argued, look, the fear we should have is a fear of overreaction. That instead of creating a new balance that would help authors, we'll see this complete extreme response that will make it hard for people to even share creativity, even in a non-commercial way on this platform. And when I wrote those books, people said the fear was overblown, that I was being too extreme. But I want to show you a little clip from a video just about a month old by Paul Davids, 
who's a European who tries to teach people how to play the guitar. So he creates these YouTube videos to teach people how to play the guitar. This is a little bit from his clip. This video, for example, in this video about licks and playing a tiny lick of an eagle song, just one lick. And now And now this video is completely blocked for viewers in the United States, where coincidentally my biggest public is. And all the advertising money videos made from the rest of the world goes to them. Everything, not one cent for me. So for a two second lick, eight little notes, da -da 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 -da, in a freaking 15 minute long video, doesn't matter. The rest of the video doesn't matter. So he describes in this system, in this video, how the system that's evolved in YouTube can almost within half an hour of uploading a video, identify any similar links between what you have uploaded and things that are copyrighted and immediately implement a system where all advertising revenue from that video is given to copyright owners or the video is blocked depending on the particular jurisdiction with an extremely difficult strategy for resisting or fighting it because of course it takes an enormous effort to get them to reverse that judgment. Or just about a dozen years ago when my friend Aaron Swartz convinced me to give up the work I was doing on copyright with the very sensible argument. He said then, how do you expect anything that you're doing to have any effect so long as we have this deeply corrupted political system? To which I responded, you know, Aaron, it's not my field. And he said, you mean it's not your field as an academic? I said, yeah, it's not my field as an academic. I do internet policy and copyright. He said, well, what about as a citizen? Is it your field as a citizen? And on that night in 2006, I promised him that I would give up my work on the internet and I would take up this project to take on this corrupted political system. And I've written three books and one that will come out in the fall. You should order it right now on Amazon. They don't represent us that tries to map and tell the story of why and how this system had become corrupted and what we can do in response. But even Aaron, in 2008, left the reform projects and said to me, why, why should we worry about reform right now? After all, we're going to elect Barack Obama president of the United States. And he's going to give us climate change legislation and health care for all and all of the other things that a sensible democracy would deliver. And of course, we did elect Barack Obama, but he didn't give us those or the changes that might make this democracy work. OK, so I've come to recognize you need to just embrace my Cassandra. <laughs> yes, I mean, she was taller and more beautiful than I am, but I will embrace the digital version of Cassandra here. And I will say to you whether I can affect you by saying this or not is a Cassandra-esque question. But let me just say to you, we must make them reformers. Or we, this democracy, loses our capacity to govern. Not just on the issues that we're talking about, like climate change or healthcare or infrastructure or economic growth but also about issues we don't even begin to have the capacity to talk about, but that other nations are talking about, like China right now, AI, surveillance, the future of work, or what happens when the robot overlords actually take over. My point is we need a sensible government. That is not optional in the 21st century. And unless we convince them to take up the fight to give us that, we lose the capacity for this thing we absolutely require. But let me tweak the Cassandra bit by just adding a Hollywood happy ending to this story. Because I really believe we can do this. I didn't two years ago. Two years ago, I really thought the political system had lost the capacity to fix itself. But bizarrely, the number one fundraiser in the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, has convinced me to the contrary. Because if we could push candidates who try to unify America, not divide them, 
and get those candidates to commit to reform. And if, and I realize this is a big if, but if we could get them to commit to their own POTUS one on the model of Nancy Pelosi, fundamental reform that they will address first, then I think it is possible, possible, that we win this fight, that democracy wins, that sensible governance becomes possible again, because the thing we know about presidents, at least presidents who actually win the election, is that they get their number one first. They get in their first 100 days the thing they said they wanted most. We give that to them. And so if a president followed Pelosi and made reform the thing that he or she wants, there is a chance, more than there has been in my lifetime, there is a chance that reform could be achieved. So just about, just over 11 years ago, April 2008, Barack Obama gave a speech in which he said, we had to take up that fight. Before the AFL-CIO in Philadelphia, Obama said, if we're not willing to take up that fight, the fight to change the way Washington works, then real change, change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans will keep getting blocked by the defenders of the status quo. Take up that fight. Now, I love that president. He was a friend at Chicago. I think he was an extraordinary president, but the truth is he did not take up that fight. He did not propose a single change to the way we fund campaigns. He didn't even deliver on the single promise he made about campaign funding, which was to propose, let alone pass, but even propose a change to the presidential public funding system. He did not take up that fight. But his words 11 years ago were right then, and they are right now. But we should focus on for whom are they right. You know, so I'm a big brain sort of person. I mean, I have a big head. I mean, both, you know, I mean, figuratively maybe, but I mean, actually, literally, my head is really big. So really focusing on ideas is important to me. So obviously, when I say for whom, I mean also for reason. It is reason that leads me to these conclusions I've tried to convey to you tonight. But I'm also a weepy and sappy romantic and would say for love is why we must take these ideas up and fight. For love of country. But even more to me, for love of our kids. Because who loses because we can't govern? We talk about climate change, but how many of us will really feel the consequence of climate change? Climate change will be felt by our kids. It is almost 20 years to the day since crazy men with unregulated guns terrorized the Columbine community and killed those children. And yet, to this day, we've done nothing effective about it. Does that affect us? It affects our children. We've lost the capacity, the political capacity, to control our debt in this nation, which is literally us borrowing from our kids. Thank you very much. Borrowing we will never pay back. They will pay back when it comes time to reckon our own expenses. And health care costs, which of course are extraordinary for all of us and especially the future for them, is a consequence of the gifts we've given pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies, gifts that they will pay the price for every single problem we have put on them. Because we have not rebuilt a government that represents us. Tom Brokaw writes of at least my grandfather's generation that they were the greatest generation. I fear my generation is the worst generation, the worst generation. But there is no reason we must be. 
because we can inspire them. Politics is about inspiring, and usually it's about them inspiring us. John Kennedy inspiring us. But this time it has to be us inspiring them. This time we have to give them the courage to do what their experts say cannot be done, to rally all of America to these ideals that all of America already hold, the ideals that this democracy should be for us, and that we can once again make that so. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Well, now we have a third thing. We have a third thing in common. Here? Yep. Uh, I, too, am a weepy romantic. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going to do questions and answers. Um, I'd like you to keep the questions short and not give speeches. Okay? Right. What can we do with, <clears throat> as individuals, would you recommend? Well, you know, people who live in Concord, New Hampshire, I'd have an easy answer for that, <laughs> which is that they will be living with these candidates for the next year. And, uh, and what they should be doing is in every single opportunity they have, pushing this question to them. But I think this is the discipline we all must adopt. We have to express our skepticism for their fantasy politics by saying, no, how are you going to fix the system first? How are you going to give us democracy first? And if they don't want to answer that question, we've got to hold them to it. You know, because either they're stupid or they think you're stupid. Either they don't get it or they think you don't get it. But they do get it. I know they get it because I know these people. These are honest, hardworking people, our representatives. Every one of them, regardless of their politics, went to Washington for the right reason. And when they get there, they find the system is just a system that forces them to survive, to behave in ways they all know is not what a democracy should be. So they get it. And if they began to see that we got it and that we're insisting something be done about it and we're not willing to send a check unless they're telling us what's the thing they're going to do first, then they'll begin to listen, they'll begin to respond. And I think that's everything, but that's a huge thing if we could get people to do that. So we should work through our representatives, is that what you're saying? Yeah, we work through representatives and you use that power you know, to also work through these people are trying to become president. Now you're not Concord, New Hampshire, you're Concord, Massachusetts, but there's a lot of that influence here too. And I think that's the place to press it, to make that the constant conversation. If we can make it the center, then I think we have a chance to convince them. Um, hello, my Hi. name is Christian Kruger, and I am associated with the Massachusetts Coalition Against Jerry Henry. And by associated, I mean I want to work on Jerry Henry and there was an organization, and so I mean it. Um, Excellent. And <laughs> as I've been going around trying to raise awareness about it, I have noticed that despite it being such a immensely visceral facet of our democracy. Very few people know even what it is. They look at my card and they go, this is great. What's gerrymandering? <laughs> and you think a lot more people would know. So in ways to figure out how to raise awareness, I noticed that CNN has been giving presidential town halls to just about everyone. Like you could run an American flag beanie baby and they would give them a town hall. <laughs> so I run, wonder if perhaps you might want to run again. <laughs> 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 you could probably make it to the debates. And then you could go and you could say, hey, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders. So rather than a choral reform, yeah. <clears throat> think maybe that could be a thing? I, I <laughs> Well, you know, I, I don't often like to talk about what happened before because it was so freaky, embarrassingly difficult, <laughs> what happened before. You know, so the last time when I tried to run, uh, 
I said I would run focusing on this issue fundamentally. And I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, I don't want to blame other people for the mistakes, but, but this issue fundamentally. And, um, and the Democrats um, said, well, you have to get 1% in three polls within six weeks of the debate, and then you can be on the debate stage. And when I was deciding to run, it was like, that would be enough. Like, I'm running for president. I mean, I'm, this is not just a gimmick, but it would be enough just to be able to be on the debate stage for exactly the point, reason you said. So um, I said, I'll run if we can raise a million dollars in 30 days. And we raised more than a million dollars in 30 days, which meant that I had raised more than half the people in the field, if you consider Democrats and Republicans together. <laughs> and, um, and so then the question was whether I would get the numbers in the polls. And um, the polls weren't including my name. Oh. And so Bloomberg uh, you know, Press wrote this op-ed about how ridiculous it was that they had this system, this catch-22, where I only got in if they uh, got 1%, but my name wasn't in the polls. But I thought, okay, those are the rules, and I didn't qualify. But then coming up to the second debate, I did. I was going to qualify. We had two polls. The third was going to come out. I was going to have the 1%. My campaign manager called me and he said, you're going to be in that debate. That was Monday, last week of October. Friday, he calls and said, I just got a call from the Democratic Party. They say we don't understand the rules. And they tried to give a different interpretation of the rules, and we showed them you know, the web page that said exactly what the rules were, and they said, well, the rules have evolved. <laughs> so rather than 1% in three polls within six weeks of the debate, CBS, which was running the debate, said it had to be more than 1% within, and then they gave a time period it had to happen, um, and the time period cut off two of the polls that had given me more than 1% um, in order to qualify for the debate. So when it was clear that they were not going to let me on the debate stage, then there was no reason to continue to run. But I agree with you. Being able to be on the debate stage would be everything. They, they now do it with only small donors. Yes. So you wouldn't need the polls. Yeah, so I just was told that about a month ago. So, you know, um, not that thousands of people are like you. I mean, you're obviously unique in many ways. Like, starting an organization is the kind of uniqueness that we need in America right now. So thank you for that. Um, but people have pushed me to think about it. And it's a hard question. Because, you know, the reality is it's really, it's really hard not to be a billionaire or a politician and run for office. And the reason is, you know, if I declared I was going to run for president, I would stop being paid by Harvard University. Harvard couldn't pay me anymore. You know, when Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders runs for president, they continue to collect their paychecks from the government. But, uh, but I couldn't get paid. So the campaign's allowed to pay you within a month of the first primary. So you'd have to kind of you know, have a stack of all your bills paid in advance. I don't know how many of you have that, you know, all your bills paid in advance for a year. But, um, so it's difficult. But I'm grateful for your sense that this message on that debate stage could help our democracy, because that's the only important point. So the alternative would be you'd convince some other candidates already running to do this. Oh my gosh, this is everything I've been trying to do. So we've been trying to have, this is what really depresses me, we've been trying to have in New Hampshire these democracy forum, where we just walk through all these issues with candidates. and. Um, we held the first one, and Andrew Yang, who's you know, this big UBI guy, really smart person, he agreed to do it, like, instantly. I, he, he and I were Twitter followers, so I tweeted him. He's like, yes, I'm there. And he showed up, and, and he was brilliant. And there was this amazing moment where he said, you know, I've spent the last year going around the country telling people that the first thing I'm going to do is get them $1,000 a month through my UBI proposal. But I've amended that now. Now the first thing I'm going to get them is to fix this democracy. Then I'm going to get them $1,000 a month. So that flash of recognition was everything we were trying to do. But we have been desperately begging these other candidates. And what happened is they saw Andrew Yang's exchange on YouTube, and their campaign people said, no, 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 you don't want to be cornered like that. You don't want that question to be asked of you and force you to say that the first thing you're going to do is reform because what's the environmental movement going to think? Or what are the unions going to think? Or what are the people who care about health care going to think? They're going to think you don't care about those issues. Um, so no. And so we've you know, basically been told it's not going to happen. Thank you for your uh, comments.
coming here and just sharing with us one uh, more personal and simple question first. You and the other friends of Aaron Swartz had any idea that he might end his life and could you have helped him not to do it? So I, I'm sure other people have been in this position. Suicide has an incredible blast radius. And I know that every one of us who was close to him spends our whole life thinking, what could we have done differently? I mean, we knew he was facing this extraordinary burden. And though the lawyers in his case were optimistic, um, Aaron was not optimistic, and Aaron couldn't imagine going to jail for the act of downloading too many academic articles to make available to the developing world. That was essentially what happened. So, so he fell into a moment of depression that I don't think any of us had a sense of how deep it was, but I will say We were all doing as much, and we all think we could have done more. Yeah, those files that he downloaded, the source had already let them be free. So, um, but anyway, the, the, the more difficult question, man, you called it to all for the person that shops at the root of evil or yeah. and you came to the root being politics and yeah Gandhi also had said to all the, those that say religion has nothing to do with politics with all due respect don't know what the religion is all about <laughs> so I wanted to ask you don't you think that for the American people and the whole world, politics is not the very root. The very root is who we are as human beings, as soul beings. Because the control from the very beginning of the Europeans coming to this country is by those who had the money and who thought that they can have the land stolen from the native yeah. people. Yeah. And it continues till this day. So it's the ones that have or the ones who are. That's why Thoreau said, rather than love, than money, than fame, give me truth. That truth is missing because when someone starts speaking, they were labeling him communist. And it doesn't come from Plato, a republic and the ideal. It is more old, the yeah. communist ideal, that we are all equal as beings. Yeah. No well, matter if we have anything, and if we can have anything, it's <coughs> from the earth. Yeah, so um, I would accept the description that at root, without government or society or community, uh, humans would be really destructive, horrible in many, many ways. But that's what government is for. It's to tampen those extremes and to create a society within which people don't have to rob and steal where they can prosper together. I think, I believe that's possible. And so when I look at what the problem is we have right now, I think the root is that we don't have a political system that can balance the nature in an effective enough way to continue to allow us to flourish. Now, don't hear me wrong, we never had that democracy. There's never been a moment in the history of democracy when the ideals expressed in our founding documents were real. 
They were always ideals, and they always inspired another generation to move us one step forward, one step closer, as the Constitution says, to a more perfect union. So we have a long way to go after extraordinary sin. But I still think there's a reason to talk about moving in that direction, because I think we are closer now to getting something we could be proud of than certainly at any other moment in the history of who we've been. I'll take like two more questions here. Um, I guess my question is, um, if a candidate was making political reform their number one thing, and let's just say they got elected, what do you believe that that could be affected quickly within our system? Or would it just be another bottle of snake oil, an unattainable thing? So like, let's fantasize here. What would that look like if someone made it their number one thing? And how quickly could it happen? Yeah. So if it were the number one issue of a Democratic candidate for president, it's much less likely it succeeds than if it were a number one issue for a Republican candidate for president. So I can tell you, you know, been talking to some of the people thinking about challenging this president, including our former governor. Um, and all of them think fundamental reform is the fundamental issue. So I think if a Republican took it up and were able to even just tampen down the, the president's power, um, that would change that nature of the politics. But even if a Democrat wins, two things have to happen. Number one, Mitch McConnell cannot be leader of the Senate. He is the most destructive force for democracy in America today. He has done so many things on so many fronts, and he celebrates his destruction. He thinks Citizens United was the greatest decision in a century by the Supreme Court. And you're like, really? Because there are a lot of great decisions <laughs> that we could point to. Like, let's start with Brown versus Board of Education, ending legal segregation. No. Citizens United is his decision. And he has controlled the appointments to the FEC, so the FEC does not enforce federal election law anymore. And he has rammed through judges who are as extreme as they possibly can be, who will be oblivious to any of these issues. So he has to go. He's up for re-election. I think there's a real chance he doesn't get re-elected. So that's, yeah. So that's, that's got to happen, number one. And number two, I think if there were a candidate who said fundamental reform is the first thing we're going to do, there would be a substantial movement, independent of that president, to elect people around the country in both parties who are committed to that idea. I've already, there is an amazing group that is, it's called uh, the Leadership Project, um, which is attempting to build a coalition of Republicans and Democrats who commit to making reform fundamental. But if there were a candidate who said reforms can be fundamental and that candidate began to get traction, that would inspire those movements. And America is so desperate to have a politics that doesn't force us to hate the other side. Even if there's good reason to hate the other side, we don't want to. What we want is to be able to believe again that there's a reason for us to work together as citizens. You know, my, I went to college with Frank Luntz. Uh, okay, and I love Frank Luntz, even though he helped Mitch McConnell, I mean, not Mitch McConnell, he helped Newt Gingrich destroy American democracy too. So I think Newt Gingrich is also high on that list and Frank helped Newt. But Frank said a kind of, um, like revival or inspiration of what he needs to do to save his soul before he passes. Um, and what he's been doing is going around the country having these town hall-like events, where the first part of the event is trying to drive people to be as polarized and hateful as they can. And of course, it takes nothing to get that to happen. Like one or two questions, instantly people are screaming at each other and they're like vicious, like Fox News versus MSNBC. And then he twists it around and he asks them, is this who you want to be? And almost immediately, people change. And they're like, no, we don't want to be this. 
We don't want to be this. You know, I, I grew up a Republican. I was the youngest member of a delegation in the 1980 Republican Convention. I don't hate Republicans. My father and my mother, and I think my sister, but she won't admit it to me, is a Republican. My family is, I grew up with, these are people who have different views about the way the world works. And I feel like I grew up out of those views. <laughs> Some of them didn't, but okay. I still think that we can engage as citizens on common projects, and this is a common project. I want to convince them someday about single-payer health care. I want to convince them of that. I want to convince them tomorrow about climate change. I want to be able to convince them of that. But we have a long way before we can get them to become progressives. We have to get them to work with us, both of us, both sides have to work to build citizens again, working for a democracy again. And when we get that, then I think these other things are possible. One last question. Maybe two. <laughs> um, so uh, if you get POTUS 1 to commit to it, how do you get the Supreme Court that we've got to go along with it? Yeah, so the, th the reforms that Nancy Pelosi had or the reforms that I would put in, I mean, Fred like mentioned the fact that when I tried to run, my reform proposal was basically POTUS 1. It was more aggressive public funding. I would give everybody vouchers that they could use to fund campaigns. And it was a better solution. Well, I would think that, right? But it was a better solution to the gerrymandering problem. And it was a real commitment to equality in voting, like really addressing the deep reality of inequality in the way we've allocated the right to vote, even after the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and especially after what the Supreme Court did in um, Shelby County to destroy the protections of the Voting Rights Act. So all of those are real commitments, but all of them can be adopted without any problem in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has repeated, repeatedly said, Congress can publicly fund campaigns. No problem with that, because the First Amendment is about restricting speech, and giving more money to campaigns is not about restricting speech. They've created these weird rules, bizarre, about if your funding one side effectively um, disincentivizes the other side, then there could be a First Amendment problem. But I think right now the Supreme Court has made it clear you could publicly fund campaigns. There's no doubt Congress has the power to fix the gerrymandering problem. It's just expressed in the Constitution. And even if the Supreme Court has carved back on the justifications based on race for creating voting rights protections, there's a deeper equality principle in the Constitution that would say that Congress should be able to say, at least for federal elections, you can't discriminate against people because of their party. Because, of course, race is not just party. The data show that race adds to the burden being imposed. So there's a racial component to it. It's not just politics. But eliminating the politics difference would eliminate 90% of this problem. And so we could do that easily under the existing Constitution. So no, I don't think the Supreme Court stops it. And the other side of me says, make my day. You build a political movement strong enough to get POTUS 1 enacted, and the Supreme Court takes it down, it's no time until we find a way to take the Supreme Court down, too. Not violently, I love the justices, they're you know, great people, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the Supreme Court does not live in la-la land for long. Like in our history, they've gone off the reservation and done crazy things, but they're always pulled back. And they're pulled back by democratic movements. So that's why, you know, most people in my class, you know, kind of law professor types, dream that their job is to convince five people on a court of their vision of social justice. I think that's too easy. I think we have to convince a majority of Americans of a vision of social justice. And if we do that, then the Supreme Court will follow us. So one more question, yeah. Maybe you probably answered half that question, but I'll answer, ask my question anyway. I'm very curious, Professor, to know, uh, how can a president of the United States, by him or herself, fix a broken system which has already been broken by the Supreme Court itself in its passage of Citizens United. And doesn't that need a constitutional amendment, a 20th Amendment, to say that Congress has the right 
to limit campaign uh, spending, uh, finance spending, and to also say that corporations are not people and cannot use the Bill of Rights to further their profit-driven agenda. Okay, so I absolutely support the amendment movement. I think it's incredibly important. And even if we get what I'm talking about, we still would be better off with an amendment complementing this change. And the fundamental thing that amendment should say is something our Constitution does not say. Everybody has a fundamental right to vote. And if there are a fundamental right to vote, building off that right, there would be an extraordinary range of protections that would radically change the law. But you don't need the amendment to bring about the changes that I'm talking about. And the changes I'm talking about would substantially change the business model of Washington. Now, not the president him or herself. It's the president leading to get legislation passed that makes these changes real. So public funding of congressional campaigns is something Congress could pass tomorrow. And it would change how Congress people spent their time raising money for their campaigns. When, when uh, Connecticut adopted public funding for its state legislative races, 78% of the existing, of the uh, elected representatives opted into that public funding system in the first year. 78% gave up raising money privately and just adopted this public funding system. And so I think if you get the numbers right, you can immediately change the dynamic of who they're paying attention to when they do their job to try to get reelected. And Congress can pass a law to address the gerrymandering issue. We could end the gerrymandering in Congress in one election cycle. And Congress can pass a law to assure automatic vote registration. And my, my view is Congress should begin to penalize states that don't achieve 100% vote registration. Right, so like, let's say that Congress said, whatever percentage you lack, we're going to take away from any federal monies going to your state. So if you're Georgia and you suppress the vote, which they did, then we'll take the 20% that you, a vote that you suppressed and we'll take 20% of federal monies going to Georgia and we'll just hold them. Or we'll tell you you have to spend them to make sure everybody can vote. Like we can change the incentives so they behave quick, uh, correctly. So they behave correctly according to the ideal that every citizen should have an equal chance in this democracy. So I think leadership could bring that legislation into four. And if that legislation were passed, and we had a Congress elected in a clean way, then we have a chance to get an amendment to this Constitution. Because you know, an amendment, there are two ways to get an amendment. And I support both of them. One of them is two thirds of Congress votes to propose an amendment, which then three-fourths of the states have to ratify. So two-thirds of Congress means, you know, 20 Republicans? Show me one who's going to vote for an amendment right now. Um, so two-thirds of, uh, two of Congress. The other way is if two-thirds of the state call on Congress to convene a convention <laughs> that proposes amendments, then three-fourths of the states have to ratify that too. Both of those movement, both of those processes require a strong political movement behind them. And I think the victory of getting clean elections in Congress would begin to build the movement strong enough to make that change possible. And I want to continue the fight after POTUS won to get those amendments through. But I think we take the more plausible first step before we take the what is now such a difficult step to make that amendment pass. I'm so grateful for your time and, and for your coming out tonight. I really, really